connection to e-health, telemedicine, and the medical internet of things. So our aim as um, a coalition is to bring together um, various stakeholders for a conversation. And we're hoping that that um, enriches um, the information that's shared amongst us so that each uh, stakeholder group um, has a place that they can freely have a conversation, ask questions, and then uh, feel uh, better informed. Um, I myself, I'm an accountant, economist, and I also have a background in, in computer science. Uh, we also have lawyers, we have medical doctors, um, we have nurses. Um, we have just a full gamut of people interested in this space. And in particular, we are interested in the new emerging technologies, uh, not so emerging any longer, of artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, and so forth, uh, because we are very concerned about data, how it's collected, um, how it's stored, um, how it's shared, um, how it's disposed of, um, and so forth. Um, and we also want to be able to say, let's open up data, uh, let's think about sharing in an anonymous way, um, non-intrusive, that's inclusive, um, and diverse at the same time, um, which is very important uh, for uh, medical science uh, and service delivery as well. Uh, we are also very in interested in telemedicine. Uh, we know with COVID, it has been very, very important. Um, and we know that uh, uh, many uh, communities are going to retain uh, telemedicine um, as a, a preferred manner of service delivery for a large uh, number of um, health uh, situations. So this is a discussion where we're here talking about community connection. And here what we're talking about is how can the community connect together? And this can be international community. It can be the regional community, the national level community. It can be um, in a village. Um, and we're talking about how can you help each other uh, connect? And we're talking also about the role of a good Samaritan, who may be someone who doesn't need um, healthcare services at the same time, but who has the opportunity to support someone, uh, whether it's with uh, technology, whether it's with devices, whether it's with skills to help someone stick on board um, to the internet and so forth. So that's the what the session is about. We have invited guest speakers uh, to to talk to us about uh, what their experiences have been, what their insights are, observations are, uh, what they think risks are, issues are, and concerns are, and so forth. So our session is, that's was welcome. Um, and uh, our part one is a number of invited speakers. And in part two, we're going to open up the floor. Mm -hmm. First, our, our DC members who would like to comment will make their comments as well. Um, a number of them have worked very, very hard throughout the year on a number of sessions. Uh, at the International Telecommunications Union, um, at the IGF uh, intersessional activities. Uh, we have written papers. We have a book uh, that's online. Please visit our, there's a link in the session. Please um, visit that link and you'll be able to have access to our book, um, which uh, is, is a fantastic uh, collection of articles. Um, and uh, yes, so so I look, we look forward to sharing that with you and please, uh, please access that um, and uh, we'll uh, talk about that a little bit later as well. Uh, so I have. Um, hey, Ma I, Amali, the, the, hey, Amali, good morning. Yes, here here is Amado Espinosa. Uh, local... Dr. Gomez is, is with us on the DC um, and I have a video clip with from him as he's not able to be with us and I will play that shortly. Uh, we have from Mr. Sean Dodge. Uh, with RBC, which is Royal Bank of Canada, Capital Markets in the United States, and he'll give an insight and investment in, in health, um, in e-health. I don't believe we have the Member of Parliament from Canada, Dr. Hedy Fry, um, and I'm not sure if Mr. Cross and Ms. Uh, Shah will be with us. We hope they will be able to join us. Uh, but we do have uh, Lydia with us, and uh, we hope that uh, Jerry will be able to, to join us shortly online. He, I know mm -hmm. he's trying to connect, um, but it is really not very easy connecting um, to this session. Um, so anyway, so I'm going to start, uh, sit back, relax, uh, and listen to um, these YouTube videos. Um, I'm going to try this out. And let's see whether this works. In the meantime, Amali, can you hear me? Hello? 
Hello, Amali, can you hear me? Maybe my phone is switched up there. She stopped there. It's mute from the it mute. Ah, it's on mute. It's mute. She, ah, yes. Ah, Amali, you are on mute. Can you hear me? Mute from here. Ah, it's from here? The presentation is here? It's sure. It's, it's, she, she is presenting. Okay. Uh, um, Amali, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Can you hear that, Amada? Yes, here, here I am, Amali. Amada Spinoza, yes. Okay, good. Thank you. Lost sound here now again. I would ask everybody to, to mute themselves, please, if you don't mind. Uh, maybe there's something there because we did hear. Now, why is that not working there? Okay, we're just. I'm going to start again and let's see whether this works. Well, I, I don't know, in the meantime, um, thank you very much for all the attendance here in, physically in Addis. Uh, it's a great pleasure for our dynamic coalition having you here. And yeah, we, we will be very pleased to, to listen a little, bit, a little bit about what you are doing right now in, in, the, in terms can of- Can you hear that? It, yes, I can hear you. I can hear you. I, I don't know if you can hear me. Frederick, can you hear the, uh, hear what's happening? Uh, I uh, I can hear you, but I, I don't know if you can hear me. Uh, excuse me. I think she's trying to open the YouTube link and uh, probably you, you can tell her to copy the link and uh, she can straightly go to YouTube and play it. Very well, uh, um, I, I don't know, the, the uh, IT guys, uh, do you think, uh, who, who, is, who is controlling the, the presentation right now because she she's controlling? But uh, it's an, it's mute. Can, can you were you hearing what was going on, please, Frederick? Can you hear? Uh, uh, yes, I can hear you, but I I don't know. Can, you can hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, excuse me, something is going on. She can speak, but we cannot communicate. Now, I would like to emphasize these points in particular, uh, which is that it is quite important that patients in patients self monitoring. Not all of them like we we listen something like in the back, but we uh, see you, Amali. That, uh, before, we have your image, but we presentation is uh, not working. 
and uh, there is a component of, of the can you hear me yes can you hear me yes yeah. can you hear us yes. and, um, can you hear me yes yes tech support yes tech support there is no shortage of examples of technologies such as biometric sensors apps wearables that actually facilitate the job and on the other end we also have to consider the societal and the economic impact which the costs can potentially be reduced by either governments or citizens and nonetheless i must add that data on healthcare expenditure does not necessarily back this statement and by this i mean that we actually see increased costs coming along the input function of these technologies so one of Excuse the me, there is something confusing going on. There is a captioning going on for some different discussion. Uh, but this actually only accounts for a small percentage of this increase uh, in the expenditure. And actually, the majority of it comes from the introduction of the technologies and these incremental improvements, either in the diagnostic, but also in the treatment path. And um, they do not fully disrupt how medicine is performed. They just slightly increase uh, the outcomes or the processes. However, I'm confident that this expenditure happens mostly due to the fact that um, these the technologies are novel. A lot of the costs are sunk into the development, developments, I mean, of um, the technologies themselves and into studying what are the highest efficiency applications for those. And of course, that there are other barriers. I must not overlook those. Not everything is possible when distance, literacy, and reliability of these technologies are factors to be taken into account. But if on one hand, the traditional physical examination is not possible, it's also up to us to change this gap, uh, to close it, and to reinvent the process that was formally established as being the regular medical practice. And for this to happen, what we need is interoperability with everyone being considered in this process from patients to governments healthcare professionals to uh, the administration of our facilities and uh, ultimately it's a joint effort uh, and it's an effort that should be undertaken by everyone so we need to be very well aligned in the, the decisions that are made forward of course policy helps but sometimes it's binding and uh, that fact uh, it's a uh, not necessarily very motivating, uh, but definitely drives change. So we have to consider all these factors when definitely looking for this change in our healthcare is performed these days. It's on this note that I want to conclude. And thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm definitely sure to follow through on the outcomes of this panel and to have further conversations with all of you. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Can you? Can you hear me? I'm going to just try. Can you hear us? Yes, now I can hear you. Okay. Yeah, me, someone me, said- there, there was a conflict with the video and the Zoom at the same time. We only okay. see your image. We, we do not see the video. Then I think uh, for the sake of time, Amalie, we can continue yeah. with the agenda and, and yeah. skipping the video at this point. What about that? Okay, I have another video too. Uh, someone said, here's the video link. So I'm gonna give the video links to people. Um, let me do that. And... Uh, So there are two video links, um, and please, what we will do is we will post this to um, our website um, for everyone to see. Um, uh, so that's a shame that we, it doesn't come through. Um, is there any way for IT to, to support us and show these videos for us? You can share the link to the, to the techie guy who is chatting with you and he can try to do it uh, on site. Okay. 
Okay, I have shared two because they're both important uh, topics. So, tech, tech, can you please try to uh, play both the links I've sent to you now? How long does it take for both videos, Amali? Uh, it's about nine minutes, but it's okay, important let's because pick we, one. we are missing people. Let, let's pick no, we, one. We, no, 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 we need to do both. We okay, do okay. Both. Then. We, have plenty, we have plenty of time. We have plenty of time. So please, uh, technology, can you please play, play both? Okay, okay, hold a moment. We're missing a couple of speakers, uh, Amado, so I think we have plenty of time. Okay, can, can we, in the meantime, make some introductions, Amali? Do you agree with that? Or we, we, we did at the beginning. Ah, okay, we perfect. did at the beginning. Uh, there there, yeah, are, yeah, we there did. are some other people here at, uh, at the audience, if you want to meet Okay, them. How, many, how many do you have in the room? We, we are about 20, 20 people, more or less. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. So do you think the technology people will be able to, to show these two video uh, links? They, the they are trying in, well, let, let me ask again. Yes, yes, no. Okay, it looks like they, they are, they are going to try. Yeah. Okay. Good morning. My name is Sean Dodge, and I'm an equity analyst at RBC Capital Markets, covering the digital health, uh, healthcare IT space. I want to start by thanking Amali and the rest of the team for the invitation to speak today. And I apologize for it neither being live nor in person, but nevertheless excited for the opportunity. And what I'm here to briefly touch on is the state of health IT investing uh, here in the United States and, and what we're seeing from the standpoint of the proliferation of technology throughout healthcare. And just to put our conclusion here up front, I'll, I'll dig into more detail in just a moment, but the short answer is we're really encouraged by both the funding and innovation trends we're seeing and cautiously optimistic. We're finally approaching a tipping point when it comes to leveraging technology to deliver better health outcomes and experience for people at lower costs. I'll begin uh, just to provide a little bit more context for those of you who are less familiar with US healthcare. Our system here certainly isn't broken, but it also isn't functioning optimally either. There's a lot of data out there that shows we spend more than most other developed nations on a per capita basis and are not really getting commiserate outcomes. There are a handful of reasons why this is the case. We think the vast majority of it stems from our reimbursement system, how we pay for healthcare that over time is misaligned incentives for providers and disenfranchised the individual as a consumer, which have both combined again contributed to the situation we now find ourselves in. Good news is we've been working hard to fix this and given what we're seeing happening across the space with respect to things like increased funding, uh, accelerating innovation, more individual awareness and comfort using new technologies and, and new payment models, there are reasons to be increasingly hopeful we're finding our way out of this. And if we think about what's needed, there are two critical elements necessary to drive this forward. One is good technology and the other is individuals who are willing and incentivized to use it. On the first, the technology, what's been very positive is a significant increase as we've seen over the last few years in investment or funding in this space. I'll share some numbers to help with their context and then offer some of our thoughts here, but Rock Health does a really good job of tracking venture funding. This year has been a bit of an anomaly, we believe, just given the more difficult macro backdrop. But if we look at 2021 data, there was over $29 billion of venture funding raised. That number, the 29 billion, was nearly double what was raised the year before in 2020, and it was nearly four times the $8 billion that was raised in 2019. So there's just been remarkable growth, acceleration in the money flowing into the space. And then coming uh, back to this current year, through the third quarter of 2022, there's still been nearly $13 billion raised so far. So even in spite of the challenging capital markets backdrop, this year is still on pace to be better than 2020. And now why we find this encouraging is the vast majority of this money is being used to drive innovation. So we expect to see some exciting accelerations and advancements in the space. If we look at the top two technologies being funded per Rock Health, telehealth and startups incorporating artificial intelligence continue to be the most funded, most targeted areas. 
What's also interesting is these funding numbers, they're not capturing the sizable investments being made in the space by very large, less traditional players. Some examples here are Amazon, of course, bought its, its pill pack pharmacy a few years back, and it's now in the process of acquiring One Medical, which is getting it into brick and mortar healthcare. CVS recently announced it's acquiring Signify. Last year, we saw Oracle acquire Cerner. Walmart recently bought a telehealth company. So again, our point here is lots of money being deployed into the space, which we think sets off this virtuous cycle that'll help accelerate innovation over the years to come. The second element I mentioned was just around the changing consumer behavior to drive adoption. The pandemic was a big accelerant here. It did a wonderful job at driving awareness and first time utilization of all different kinds of health technologies. And so awareness and comfort with these uh, have come a long way in a short amount of time. Some quick data here, uh, one company we follow, Stericycle, just released findings from a survey they did around individual behavior when it comes to pursuing healthcare. And they found that 45% of respondents now report receiving healthcare at a non-traditional venue outside of their doctor's office. So this is notable because this is magnitudes higher than it would have been pre-pandemic. And I think it's showing as people are eager and willing to change. So now just to wrap up, and, and apologies for having to keep this so high level, but given the time constraints, we're, we're more than happy to follow up with anyone who wants to dig into more detail here. I'm sure Molly can, can supply my email address to coordinate something. But the message we want to get across here is when it comes to healthcare and technology, the pieces are falling into place. Investment in the space is accelerating quickly, and we have much more engaged and aware individuals looking for better and cheaper alternatives for their healthcare. So again, we remain very optimistic on the future. Uh, thank you. Good morning. First of all, I would like to greet the other members of the panel and the audience, both in the venue and also virtually. Unfortunately, and as you've realized by now, I'm not able to be present live in this session, but I'm happy to contribute with some thoughts of mine on the topic. Just as a context, I'm a medical doctor from Portugal, and I'm currently working for a German digital health company. In there, we aim to streamline the process of the patient admission through AI processing of the symptoms. So based on the patient's symptoms as an input, we are able to assign the levels of priority for them to be assessed by an healthcare professional. So triaging in direct terms. And it's precisely here that I would like to start with my first point, which is that the greatest opportunity coming from these technologies derives from the fact that we don't look at them as simple gimmicks or inevitable forces, but mostly as an opportunity to empower as many people as we can so that they can have a positive impact on themselves, but also on their families and on their communities. The final goal in any of these technologies should be quite clear. It is for the benefit of the patients and ultimately the improvements of their health status. This is not to say that anything that goes beyond that uh, should be eliminated. We are not expecting, for example, that an MVP uh, provides benefit right from the get-go. Uh, but at least that we should have a well-defined added value long-term goal. And um, if this goal is quite clear, uh, the path to achieve it and the means are not necessarily that objective. So this can be achieved either through the improvements in the treatment outcomes, faster diagnosis, uh, easier monitoring, or even through the process of training the patients on uh, how to educate themselves and how to manage their own conditions. And I would like to emphasize these points in particular, uh, which is that it is quite important that patients engage in self-monitoring. Not all of them will have this need and not all of them will have that will, but it's definitely not something that uh, should be forced, but it should be available for the patients to, to choose and to opt uh, when given that option. And uh, there is this components of responsibility, empowerment and accountability when the patient is able to actively engage in the care plan that was previously defined for him. And um, we also know that an engaged patient is the patient that most willingly complies with the need of therapies and the plan that was defined for him. There is no shortage of examples of technologies such as biometric sensors, apps, wearables that actually facilitate this process. And on the other end, 
we also have to consider the societal and the economic impacts in which the costs can potentially be reduced by either governments or citizens. And nonetheless, I must add that data on healthcare expenditure does not necessarily back this statement. And by this, I mean that we actually see increased costs coming along the introduction of these technologies. So one of the main drivers of increased health expenditure over the last years could be thought to be, for example, the fact that we are getting older or that longevity is increasing. Uh, but this actually only accounts for a small percentage of this increase uh, in the expenditure. And actually the majority of it comes from the introduction of these technologies and these incremental improvements, either in the diagnostic, but also in the treatment path. And um, they do not fully disrupt how medicine is performed. They just slightly increase uh, the outcomes or the processes. However, I'm confident that this expenditure happens mostly due to the fact that um, these uh, technologies are novel. A lot of the costs are sunk into the development, development I mean, of um, the technologies themselves and into studying what are the highest efficiency applications for those. And of course, that there are other barriers. I must not overlook those. Not everything is possible when distance, literacy, and reliability of these technologies are factors to be taken into account. But if on one end, a traditional physical examination is not possible, it's also up to us to change this gap, uh, to close it, and to reinvent the process that was formally established as being the regular medical practice. And for this to happen, what we need is interoperability with everyone being considered in this process, from patients to governments, healthcare professionals to um, the administrations of our facilities. And uh, ultimately, it's a joint effort uh, and it's an effort that should be undertaken by everyone. So we need to be very well aligned in the, the decisions that are made forward. Of course, policy helps. But sometimes it's binding and uh, that fact, uh, it's uh, not necessarily very motivating, uh, but definitely drives change. So we have to consider all these factors when definitely looking for this change in how healthcare is performed these days. It's on this note that I want to conclude. And thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm definitely sure to follow through on the outcomes of this panel and to have further conversations with all of you. Thank you so much. Uh, Amalie, can you hear us? The floor is yours. Uh, oh, have sound here. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, hold a moment, Amali. We cannot hear you. Hold a moment. Okay, now. Uh, now, can you try, please? Uh, no, no, uh, you, we, no, we cannot hear you now. Wait, wait a moment. Okay. Uh, try. Can you hear me now? Uh, yes, positive. Thanks. Okay. okay, good. I'm going to share my screen again. Um, and um, here we are. So um, I don't believe um, Dr. Hedy Fry is um, online with us. So I'm not sure, is Mr. Bastian Quast in the room or online with us at all? Bastian, are you in the room? Okay. Um, I don't think uh, Ms. Gitandali Shar is in the room or online with us. No? Okay. So I'm going to move to the last two um, speakers, um, uh, Ms. Lydia Best and Mr. Jerry Ellis. And I'm going to leave, uh, they have been collaborating on, on this piece. So I'm going to leave um, this uh, to both of them to take up from here. The floor is yours, Lydia and Jerry. Um, thank you very much um, for um, inviting me here. But I would like first to give the floor to Jerry because Jerry would like to um, take up first. So Jerry, you ready? If Jerry is not ready, then I will pick it up. The host is yep. the host. Can you hear me now? Okay, off you go. Yep. Okay, thank you. 
Good morning to everyone, whether you be in Ethiopia or anywhere around the world. Good morning from Dublin in Ireland. It's almost seven o'clock here in the morning. So, okay, let me start my video. Okay. Is that better? Okay, let's get going. Uh, I'm blind and Lydia is hard of hearing, so we're going to speak on the area of accessibility for people with disabilities. There are 1.3 billion people with disabilities in the, in the world today, and even if, if that's not quite accurate, we'd say that at least one in seven people alive today have some, some level of disability. So the area of disability is not a fringe issue. It is very much at the core of health and, uh, and society. There are a number of interrelated disability friendly frameworks which have been developed over the last few years, which indicate that this is also not a fringe policy issue, but an issue that is at the forefront of international policies. So you have the strategic development goals, which I'll speak about in a moment the New Urban Agenda, the Sendai Framework, the DACA Declaration, and of the WISIS Plus 10, and of course, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. So just to speak a little bit more about those, the, if I was at the uh, WISIS, the first WISIS meeting in Geneva way back in 2003, and its follow-up in Tunis in 2005. <coughs> and we, <coughs> excuse me, we attempted to get disability onto the agenda there and really failed. And it was a disability was never agenda in, mentioned in the Millennium Dis Development Goals. But, but disability is now mentioned 11 times in the Strategic Development Goals. So again, that is an indication that this is becoming very much front and center part of international thinking. So it's involved in SDG for education, SDG for employment, SDG reducing equality, SDG inclusive cities, SDG means of implementation, and sections on data recording and presentation to ensure that they are accessible. <clears throat> so you can see that it's very much front and center. The United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, actually its anniversary comes up in two days time on Saturday, December the 3rd. Disability is mentioned 20 times particularly in Articles uh, 25 and 26. An important thing about the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities is it differentiates between impairment and disability. So it says impairment is what's happening inside a person's body, what most people will consider illness. So for instance, I'm blind, another person may have motor, motor neuron or whatever. The UN Convention says that's impairment. But what the UN Convention says is the disability is the failure of society to accommodate the needs of people with impairments. And that is absolutely crucial to our message, that it is society that creates disability by refusing or failing to meet the needs of 1.3 billion people with disability in the world. That's a, a, a major failure. And how do you do that and why do you do that? So why do you do it in the area of health is that People with disabilities are patients, of course, some are, some aren't, but many also work in the area of health. So a person with a disability could be perfectly healthy, <clears throat> but maybe a doctor, maybe a nurse, maybe an employee in a hospital or other health centre. So you have to consider that it is not just from the point of view of patients. And how do you make all your tools, particularly your technology tools accessible? You use universal design. Universal design is an approach that includes the needs of the maximum numbers of potential users. And there's any amount of documentation out there as to how you implement universal design in technology, in health, and any number of standards. With that, I'm going to hand over to Lydia, and Lydia is going to get down to more specific stuff than I. Thank you, and good luck from Dublin. Thank you very much, Jerry. That was a great introduction to the persons with disabilities and 
a general um, discussion around the e-health and um, telehealth. So uh, my name is Lydia Pes and I am the president of the European Federation of Hard of Hearing People. And together with Jerry, we are one of the experts um, involved in the International Telecommunication Union standardization process. And I will bring you up following listening to a great discussion about AI and how it can be used and how it can be beneficial for patients. Well, AI can be as good as it can be, but if it's not accessible to persons with disabilities and the doctors, then it's not really very useful. Therefore, I would like to introduce you to the World Health Organization and ITU joint collaboration on developing global standard for accessibility of telehealth services. The standard is completely free and um, downloadable for anyone who would like to use it and who should be encouraged to use it. And the profile of the actual accessibility of telehealth has been raised during the pandemic. And as we know, most of the healthcare services do continue using that um, form of providing healthcare. And the challenges have been quite um, well documented across the world of a person with disabilities using the services. There were no guidances no, um, for accessibility and, you know, um, most of the services were completely inaccessible. So the new standard, which has been developed with the, the organizations for persons with disabilities, has been targeting governments, healthcare services providers and manufacturers of telehealth platforms. And most importantly, those who are involved in the procurement of the services, meaning the national health services, etc. It does provide technical requirement that telehealth platform must have to ensure accessible telehealth provision. And if implemented, it has a massive potential for inclusion. I will not say what exactly is in the standard, but just in general, all of the different persons with disabilities, blindness, deafness, hard of hearing, speech language difficulties, mobility, mental health, etc., are being um, in, included in the standard. And I will give you just shortly, for example, how the standard works. It has the requirements. It also has the issues. So the issues are presented, what exactly is the issue? And then it follows up with the requirements. So for example, the requirements are, without going into the issues now, but video conferencing shall provide captioning and a monitored chat box that has volume control provision along separate windows for the people who are deaf and hard of hearing. The text messaging shall be included in the service and it also, um, in case the video is not working or audio. And the remote sign language interpretation should be also enabled. In addition, um, clear subtitling, uh, not in the way that we can actually use the subtitling so it doesn't blend in the background. One more thing which is important is also that the screen for the telehealth must be large enough for the lip readers. So the lip reading is very important for many people like myself who, who are hard of, who's hard of hearing. In addition, this standard also includes a planning phase. A lot of times the tele telehealth platform might be accessible, but if the planning, the appointments process and um, uh, 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 identifying the needs of the patients, the specific needs related to the disabilities is not there, then we cannot even use the platform which is accessible. So for this, um, the planning requirements are to provide accessible ways and means to make an initial appointment via emails, SMS and online booking systems to provide the range because as we heard before, there are also older people using the technology which we may not be familiar with. And it needs to 
we need to make sure that for persons with disabilities, we allocate more time during the appointment. So we shouldn't be using the standard appointments. <coughs> and also provide robust and transparent registration which identifies the individual's requirements. And most of all, without a brief training um, or even more in depth for the healthcare professional on how to communicate with persons with disabilities and how to um, interact, all these technologies which are being made up accessible will still not benefit everyone because we don't know how to interact with each other. So this is a very short introduction of a new standard for me, which has been um, launched in June this year. And I really hope more people will um, start looking into that and implement. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lydia and uh, Jerry. Thank you very much for the very insightful uh, introduction to, to the excellent work that has been going on. Um, and I, I hope that um, everyone will um, implement um, that work. Um, I myself as well have been uh, working on something called gender-based analysis, which includes um, accessibility, uh, looking to accessibility issues as well. Um, and I know it's uh, very, very important as we're all going digital, we're all going online. Um, you know, there's has to be fairness and um, equitable access um, to the internet. So um, thank you so much for that uh, introduction. Um, I, I don't believe, and now I'm just going to move on, um, I don't believe our other speakers are with us. So I think we'll move on to part two. And uh, then we're just going to have an open discussion um, with anyone in the room um, and anyone um, else as well. So part two, basically I want to say that um, we are launching here today uh, what we call a toolkit for onboarding uh, to the internet. Um, and in this case, what we're doing is we're asking all of you um, and anyone you may know um, who would like to participate to share with us um, through a, a piece, um, a written piece um, on um, issues pertaining to onboarding as uh, Lydia and Jerry have been talking about. Um, tips, for instance, uh, we have already have a piece on privacy um, and I, I encourage you to, to visit our um, webpage on the Internet Government Forum uh, website. The link is at the bottom of the session. And uh, we want to add to this. We want to add any tips, any insights um, that people have um, on supporting um, individuals on board to the Internet or supporting Good Samaritans uh, who may come in uh, to support uh, someone on board to the Internet. So uh, please be very welcome um, to uh, share with our dynamic coalition your piece, and we hope that we can uh, publish it um, with our other pieces as well. So that's one. Uh, the next part is I wanted to invite anyone from our dynamic coalition to speak. Uh, is there anyone who would like to speak? Please, please uh, raise your hand. Frederick, would you like to have the floor? Uh, yes, um, we we want to have everybody here in the room. To if somebody wants to participate, please uh, tell us. Yes. We we have we have um, by the way, uh, Amali, uh, Doctor Pratap, with us, who okay. kindly joined the session from the. Uh, also the, the dynamic coalition on on collaboration on digital health then uh, okay. if you allow me I can bring him to to sure. make a participation please. thank you please yeah. thank you yes, please do that. thanks sir and thanks Amali for this wonderful session and a great way to start the day um, I think this is the need of the hour uh, during COVID, we only accelerated what was proven earlier, like digital health is health and not the other way around. And I'm glad that there are DCs that are working in this area and we must collaborate. And I think onboarding toolkit is a great initiative because uh, that's very critical to make sure there is a universal adoption of digital health, not just among clinicians, but also among allied health workers. And anything that we can do to support We'll be very happy to do that. We're going to announce some of the projects today in the afternoon on the uh, future uh, of internet with the Tech Envoy 
I look forward to supporting you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pratap. Uh, Dr. Pratap is also uh, working very hard here uh, in, in this area. He has also a booth here in our uh, in our IGF village. Uh, we invite all of you to visit him and all the materials he kindly is providing there for us. Uh, and now I, I want to invite also Ms. June Paris, who is a former MAC member. Uh, she is also a former healthcare professional. Uh, nowadays, very close involved with the um, digital transformation in the health sector. June, the, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. I'm June Paris. Um, I'm from Barbados. Um, I'm involved with the Internet Society Barbados chapter, but um, also as a former healthcare professional, this um, I'm really happy to see the, um, this dynamic coalition um, come into the fore. Um, it's very important that we discuss health, especially and this people with disabilities, it's so important that we bring the problems to the fore and, you know, and discuss how we can solve these problems. I'm very happy to be a part of this discussion and I will give you all the support that you need. Thank you very much, uh, June. Um, is, is there somebody else here in the room who wants to make any remark? Uh, Maybe Roberto Roberto Zambrana is also here with us uh, from Latin America. Uh, maybe you can share us a little bit about the experiences in Bolivia and the applications of the telemedicine and some some results from the perspective of the ministry that you were uh, collaborating with. Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much, and good morning, everyone, the ones that are online as well. Uh, well, indeed, uh, in Bolivia, there were a couple of programs of telemedicine back in 2008, I will say. From that moment and beyond, there were programs to take advantage later on when we deployed the Tupac sat uh, Qatari satellite. There were programs that wanted to take advantage of this uh, of this resource and to provide uh, these uh, kind of services um, to um, populations in the rural area when we don't have, well, when we are lack of uh, health facilities, but also of uh, medical, uh, medical, medical personnel. So that was uh, an initial step. Um, but the problem again was the lack of specialized equipment because it's it, but, but 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 by that time it's not only about um, the communication but it was also about having the corresponding tools to provide this kind of connection between the um, the health service facilities in the cities and to take those that that kind of connection with that kind of physicians to the rural area and um, the other problem was that uh, initially the expectations about having a satellite connection and to provide this kind of services remotely uh, couldn't be totally fulfilled because the kind of connection that we all know we need for certain applications wasn't needed. What I mean is that finally uh, the government managed to get uh, specialized equipment with monitors, with um, with telepresence kits, uh, but the problem uh, then was the that uh, the kind of uh, speed that this required that, that this equipment required were 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 not sufficient um, going through the satellite connection. Um, but it is uh, continuous working. Uh, there were some other programs that um, uh, were established actually during pandemic. And I will say we, as community, we got our expectations below. Where for that time, another interesting experience was that um, most of the crowded service back then, as it happens in all over the world regarding COVID attention, uh, had to deal with massive amount of people requiring health services. And uh, we kept 
it's simple because back then I, I'm not currently working anymore. But back then I was working uh, and in charge of the IT sector in the city hall in La Paz. So we had to work with the health ministry regarding uh, providing this kind of attention so to this mass of people. And uh, we used the basics. We used to WhatsApp and the, 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 the facilities that they have regarding um, connection with the video of this, this, this kind of tool. And back then it was important to have it because it allowed us to reduce all the load that we were receiving in the traditional channels and in the uh, usual facilities. What, uh, it's important to keep going in this. I think there are many tools, there are many kind of equipment now that provide us and may allow us to take advantage of this kind of, of, of technologies and services through internet. But at the same time, uh, the other thing that we suffered back then and we are still suffering is that we don't have really universal connection as it happens in many parts of Global South. That's something that tending that we need to reach because even though we have equipment, even though we have professionals, health professionals, uh, we are uh, preventing to provide universal services to the people that doesn't have connect internet connection in, in rural areas. That's uh, the experience that I can share. Thank you very much, Amal. Thank you, uh, Roberto. Uh, yes, if you uh, will be so kind to give your name, where do you come from, and please make your mark. Th thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Baharu Abbas. I am from the private tech sector in Addis Ababa. Uh, uh, particularly, I, I work for a dot com television show. It's a tele technology show in, in Ethiopia. My my question is, I, uh, I I would like to know about the services, uh, health services included in the e health. I mean, what kind of services are they? Uh, 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 is it simply consulting uh, the services? Uh, uh, because patient doctor relationships sometimes uh, ne need uh, physical contact, and so what kind what kind of e e uh, e uh, electronic health services are included in your premises? And uh, do we have uh, or do you have uh, state of art softwares tools to uh, to in, uh, that can be engaged in the electronic health um, uh, sector and i also would like to know the role of artificial intelligence in the e health sector thank you yes thanks for thanks for your question well i personally um, i am a physician myself i uh, i got a, a specific training in Germany in the area of uh, medical informatics, and that's how I got into the um, whole uh, initiative of the IEF. Um, from the standpoint of the medical informatics or the health informatics uh, industry, let's say, we have had different projects here in Africa, specifically some initiatives um, in a partnership with a, a, another groups in Canada in order to, to try to introduce at the Ministry of Health in Ethiopia uh, which kind of tools can be useful in your 84 regions that your uh, country has and, and how could it be possible to eventually to, to have this universal access which uh, Roberto was uh, mentioning. I think um, right now, as the, one of the speakers told us, uh, self-management self of care is one of the keystones of the healthcare sector in order to improve the healthcare uh, or the, yes, the, the, the level of health in, our, in, the, in this kind of communities. Also in the communities in Latin America, we are not really very different from yours. Uh, it, it, maybe here in Ethiopia, it's a little bit more rural, but uh, at the end of the day, we, we are facing similar problems. Then I, I think for the physicians, the, the local physicians who are working at the small clinics, in the rural areas, certainly it is going to be very key to take advantage of the different initiatives to connect those clinics into this uh, clouding service that uh, also Roberto mentioned about, and taking care about at least at least some kind 
of a electronic medical record for the clinic, which could be eventually uh, interfaced with the uh, regional electronic medical record uh, from each region, and hopefully someday also um, through the Ministry of Health. Uh, the, there was there was another keyword used by the, one of the speakers, which is inter interoperability. Interoperability is something that we have to work as as a group altogether. He also mentioned that it's not a matter of having the standards. Standards are available there. It's standards to, say, to exchange a message, HL7. It's standards to um, codify medical terms, NOMID. Is a standardized nomenclature of medicine, um, standards for um, parsing the the medical text like UMLS, which is a, uh, a standard from the National Library of Medicine, and right now it's uh, coming to an agreement with the with the WHO. Um, some some other standards for procedures and so on. And now that the uh, ICD-11 is coming in into the stage worldwide. Most probably next year, it's going to be uh, available also in Europe, in Africa. I'm sorry. Um, in probably in 2024, it's going to be mandatory to use it. It, it has a, a different approach how to classify diseases, you know, and that that's going to be also a very interesting breakthrough in order to improve the way how we are taking advantage of the technology in order to learn a little bit more about the environment, the, the public health standards or indicators that we have around us, and also how can we help patients to have kind of a personal agenda on their own health, on, on their own uh, management of health. Then I, I think from the from the perspective of the IEF, which is a multi-stakeholder uh, initiative, uh, I think there is a, a place for cyber society, academia, industry, and government to collaborate all together and try to, to define which will be, for each region, the best way to go. Certainly, language is uh, also a challenge. Uh, you have here, I think, uh, I, I can imagine at least 200, 250 uh, local uh, dialects which you have to use to incorporate to this uh, kind of works. And uh, certainly, the, the the World Health Organization is going not, not is not going to provide the translation to, into that. But if we, as, as I mentioned to you, if we can if we can collaborate, the electronic tools are already available. And uh, certainly, we, we are at the MAC and at the Dynamic Coalition. We are really very open to, to collaborate together with you and see how we can take advantage of it. And th there is there's also, also uh, one of the speakers who, who mentioned that uh, there is a, a very important initiative nowadays from a, a collaborative group between the WHO, the World Health Organization, and the ITU. Uh, in order to develop these new standards, that which uh, uh, in order for us to to use the artificial intelligence into the healthcare in different areas, it, it's very very uh, uh, interesting for you to take lo a look at the homepage of the WHO and see the different working groups. At least to know, at least to know what's going on, at least to learn what's what's already happening, and eventually to be prepared because uh, when when this committee um, comes with the final first version of these standards uh, they they have to be put in place and we have to be part of them and of course uh, IGF is responsible for for us to to be very inclusive and we want to help or to raise our voice through the special envoy and to the uh, in, in through the global digital compact in order to have the health um, application the, the application of technology into the healthcare sector to have it as a priority. But oh, please let us know 
what you what you find here in your communities that is important to be included into these standards how can IGF be kind of a bridge uh, between what's going on right now in this very high level of uh, techie, techie guys and techie uh, initiatives and the reality in our countries and uh, how these um, vehicles, uh, the, these institutional tools can help you to improve. Uh, sorry, I, I have another intervention here f uh, from the room. Amalie, if you agree. Um, I also just want to make a point. Yes, just please do it. Answer the gentleman. Um, I'm located here in Canada. I'm residing here, and just want to say there's there's lots of private sector initiatives. Um, now I know, for instance, uh, all the the testing, the medical testing done of patients. Uh, a lot of it is is done under very large contract uh, to a company, a private company. And they manage the the data and so forth um, of the patients. So that's you know obviously of interest and concern for patients. So I'm speaking from a patient perspective, from a family perspective. Uh, we also have here a very large integration between uh, the general practitioner and the hospitals. Uh, so immediately, if you visit the hospital, the GP will have all the tests and everything. Um, and there's a huge uh, uh, in initiative to integrate the, the information shared um, between um, the various groups. I also read in the newspaper recently, they are also going to integrate um, uh, the initiatives for mental health. And that also includes integrating the police as well. So that um, if they need to collaborate, um, the police uh, need to collaborate with the hospital and vice versa, that is also being opened out. Um, so we're hearing a, a lot of initiatives of opening data sets and, and collaborating on information. Uh, but uh, definitely here in UK and so forth, there's a lot of private sector initiatives going on. And a lot of GPs are also using a lot of uh, private sector um, uh, products uh, to run their actual practices. Um, and we've heard about that in, in, on various discussions uh, with our dynamic. I have to uh, stress one thing that our dynamic coalition is citizen focused, global citizen focused. So uh, our perspective is that anybody who's a global citizen who has an issue, please come and share that with us uh, because we are just open to the general public uh, who are encountering, encountering issues or, uh, or have ideas for betterment and so forth. So uh, we are a little unusual in, in that way uh, that we are very much grassroots citizen focused. So thank you, Amado. I, I, I just want to ask, uh, I know I promised our dynamic coalition members. I'm not sure if Frederick and Herman want to speak first before we go back to the flow. Would you like to have the flow, Frederick? Um, we don't hear from Frederick. Frederick, Frederick, we don't hear you if you're speaking to us. Okay, I'm gonna come back to Frederick Herman. Uh, Herman, did you want to share something? Okay, we move with uh, Dr. Pratrap, uh, please. Okay. Would, would you okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Amali. So a very important question that you've asked from the dot com show that what is covers? So I would say that, you know, uh, I represent the Dynamic Coalition on Digital Health and also on the Guidelines Development Group of World Health Organization on the Telehealth Working Group. So it covers anything that uses technology for a medical consultation or information, which will include various terminologies have come. You can actually get this report on the booth number 10. You can go and download this. It covers the entire history. The terminologies have changed from telecare, telehealth, now it's digital health worldwide. I think your point is very important. And people like you who amplify the work of Dynamic Coalition should cover that. Either you WhatsApp, email, SMS, or con teleconference to do a consultation or get information, or a doctor talking to a doctor, or a patient talking to a doctor, or even among themselves as community is covered under this domain. So that's what it is. I hope it answers your question. Yes, thank you very much. And in, in, uh, this is also... I just want to add one more point, Amado. Yes, yes, I just please. want to say that 
that when we're working in this environment as uh, the ordinary citizen, we are concerned about things like health insurance um, and very much in the West and increasingly so in Asia and I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with Africa, but definitely it's increasing in Asia as well. So when we're looking at information systems, one of the issues we're very interested in is privacy, anonymity and so forth and how our data is shared and, um, and you know, the concept that we have out of uh, Europe and so forth and in Canada and UK about patient consent. So these are uh, something that we have to, these are business issues um, that impact the patient and the user. So I just wanted to bring that in, that when we're looking at this whole phase space, we're also looking at um, other important uh, aspects of healthcare, which is uh, insurance, uh, legal aspects of it, um, accounting aspects for it, and so forth. And uh, this must not be forgotten as well. Thank you. Thank you. So back to you, Amada. Thank you. Uh, will you please, sir, introduce yourself and, and make your point? Thanks. Thanks. Uh, sorry, my English is not reading because I come from a uh, French country, uh, Ivory Coast. My name is uh, Jonas Jonde. I'm a manager program in the communication and digital economy ministry in Ivory Coast. Uh, my question concerns the managing of the human resource. I find that the new technology in e-health or telemedicine, you have very agreed that is very important for our society. But in the public sector, there is a lot of movement between public sector and private sector. When you give, you increase the competencies of the human resource, you increase the competencies of the doctors, of the nurses, they leave the public sector to go out to, go out to, the, private, uh, to the private sector. My question is, what kind of business model do you use to fix your human resource to the public sector? Uh, thank you very much for your point. And you, you know, the, this problem that uh, is um, it's a reality in most of the countries. Um, I, I'm going to share with you some experiences in Latin America, okay? I, in, in, in Germany, where I, I had some experience. Uh, the public sector, what, what is actually based upon is on the uh, continuous education programs that they have uh, already in place. And they are trying to uh, develop their capacity building strategies in order to have a, a, a let, let's say, a, uh, try to diminish the attrition rate that usually happens here. Right now, after the after the pandemics, of course, th this is a worldwide phenomena where the uh, healthcare personnel is thinking twice if they continue in this area or not, and, and several of them are quitting. And on top of that, certainly the economical perspectives at the private sector uh, sometimes are better than at the public one. Then um, uh, it, it is certainly a challenge. No matter that, I think uh, public sector uh, has to deal with the possibility, as I already mentioned, to to be part of these new initiatives uh, coming up from different international organizations who can help you to introduce uh, new infrastructure, new resources for you to, to change a little bit the paradigm of the on presence uh, healthcare providing services to go more online and taking advantage of the personnel that you have available there. Uh, at least uh, in Mexico, what we are trying to do is to help personnel to be more prepared, better prepared to take advantage of the uh, devices, to take advantage of the systems that we have already in place and that they uh, try to do their best in order to provide the best quality of care, the best possible quality of care that they have in their reach. But uh, certainly, sir, we, we should work together 
on how to motivate the personnel and how to help them to feel satisfied what, with what they are doing at the public sector. I don't know, June, maybe you have also a, a, an important perspective there. Hello, June, um, June Paris. Yeah, I agree with a lot of what you said. In, in my experience, the public sector is way behind. Um, the public sector perhaps lack, is lacking funds, um, um, and I think that they need to update training. Um, they're not really up to date on training, and fun, funds are not allocated probably in, in the best um, possible um, way. Um, whereas the private sector, I always prefer to work with the private sector because they're more efficient, um, they, they look after the pa patient's interest, they research what they should do, um, they are willing to buy equipment to update um, the, the service, and they tend to um, try to be uh, more available to the community. Um, you can talk to them, you can get in touch with them, you can say, um, this is what I want, you can um, discuss, you can have a good discussion in the private sector with those people in the private sector, um, people who manage the private sector, whereas in the public sector it's always difficult, there's lots of um, red tape, there's lots of bureaucracy, there's um, and the inability to move, to, to move forward, the inability to think like outside the box and to say this is what we should do, we should try to improve healthcare, we should try to do things a little better. Um, they're kind of stuck in their ways as public sector, as public servants and public sector people, and they have to go through all these little um, bureaucratic, bureaucratic um, situations, um, going through the ministers and going through the parliament and passing this and passing that, whereas the private sector has got more, they're more flexible, and this is why people I, like me, I prefer to work in the private sector. Thank you, June. Uh, Amada, I'm just going to take uh, take something here. I'm going to just say one comment before uh, Lydia has requested the floor. Just want to make sure that uh, everyone understands that over the past 20 years, we have, uh, we started about 20 years ago when we started working on the health issue um, and the internet and seeking that patients get more information available for them on the internet. And in Canada, for instance, uh, there's a huge uh, health care, there's uh, British Columbia Health, for instance. They have put a lot of public information out there for patients so they can understand about their diseases, um, ask questions, and so forth. And this is something um, that I think uh, can, is, can be really uh, made useful uh, to across the planet. Um, and, and it's something we have uh, talked about as well uh, previously in our dynamic coalition. And this is where somewhere something like artificial intelligence can actually be very supportive in, in helping uh, patients get self-informed and educated. Okay, so just want to share that and that can come from a private sector initiative or from a public sector initiative. Now, Lydia, please, has requested the floor and I'm going to ask Lydia, please take the floor. Um, thank you um, for uh, for ability to, to speak a little bit. So I'm really grateful. Um, having listened to everyone in the room, um, I would like to again um, highlight that accessibility is a precondition of participation, and that means if we're talking about the patients' um, participation in their own heart with the practitioners, unless we have effective information, effective tools which allow that participation, we're not going to get there. For the people who are deaf and hard of hearing, the misunderstanding and on the, of the communication of questions can lead to the wrong answers from the patient and, in the result, lead to the wrong diagnosis. So we need to remember that accessibility is paramount in this field. And um, it's great, and I believe that the private sector has a lot, especially in the innovation areas, but they often, sometimes, maybe not often, but maybe now it's much more highlighted in Israel, but we forget sometimes about accessibility. I know of many different professionals using WhatsApp, for example. It's great for the messaging. It's great for the people who can hear well enough and lip read during the video calls, but it's not for everyone. So it's about making sure that we understand the needs and how we can enable effective communication between the patient and the healthcare professional. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Amada. So again to you. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, the floor is very, very open to all the, any other participation. Is there anybody else here t uh, trying to raise a point or to share with us some experiences? Uh, okay. If, if, if it is not the case, then I, Amalia, I suggest you can c come up with some conclusions and uh, wrap up the meeting, please. Yes, I'm just going to ask again whether Frederick Rowan and Herman Ramos, whether they wanted the floor. Uh, please put your hand up uh, if you do. Okay, I don't see any hand up going. So uh, I just want to thank everybody for coming to the session. Um, it really was uh, fantastic. Uh, we had such a breadth of issues discussed um, from everything, from AI to, to accessibility to um, investment uh, to, you know, everything. So um, I would say that we, we have covered a number of issues. Um, and I think what I would like to say is, um, you know, please come and join our Dynamic Coalition and participate throughout the year. Um, and uh, next year, we hope we can focus on robotics as well um, and how that's going to come into healthcare. Um, so please join us. Uh, all I have, I, I think in summary, I'm just going to say that we covered a number of issues, but one that really stands out is about accessibility and ensuring that um, we are always aware, always including all the diverse groups of people that we call our population. And uh, this is very, very important. Um, and that's that's where I would like to. And perhaps Amada, would you like to say something? Oh, th yes, thank you very much. I, I only want to thank all the participants here for joining us. I encourage you to to keep in touch or to join the the digital uh, the dynamic coalition that it, that we already have for digital health it's very very important for us to have uh, a wider participation in order to learn from the different experiences worldwide and uh, try to manage an agenda next year's IGF it's going to be very key it's in one of the uh, latest countries in the world managing technology and specifically uh, IT for healthcare in Japan is uh, really, really at the upfront of uh, what it is possible to do, especially in an aging society, in a society which is really very close related to the technology, where the human values uh, has to be addressed there and where the different realities from different regions have to be exposed, shared with them in order for them to learn that there are other realities different than Asia or what they are looking uh, at, this, uh, at this point. Then it, it, it will be very important for us to, to be part of this discussion, to bring important topics there, which are a concern from, from your side and the this dynamic collection, collection can be the, the best uh, vehicle to, to address them. Uh, no further points? Okay, thank you very much everybody for joining us. Uh, my name is Amado Espinosa, uh, former MAC member of the IGF, and yes, uh, anything we can do in order to help you, uh, we are at your service. Thank you everybody. This is, my name is Amali De Silva Mitchell, um, and uh, I'm the founder and coordinator of this dynamic coalition. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye, uh, Amali. Thank you, Amada. Wisdom is doing a session in large briefing room, so I'm gonna go and do that. We Which room? Wisdom, large briefing room. Large briefing room, okay. Large briefing room. Okay, yeah. let's go. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your help. Thank you. 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 Thank you.